Once we know that, we try to explore and look into what are the benefits we can achieve from practicing this, and what are the pitfalls if we don't practice it. And when we understand that thoroughly and wholeheartedly, the desire to practice will arise then, one. Once the Dathaya arises, we started with grounding ourselves with precepts. Precept is the foundation of this practice. Without a proper foundation, whatever you built after that will not be strong and firm, and more likely to collapse. And once we grounded ourselves with sila, then we start practicing this meditation. In general, we say we practice inside meditation through full foundation of mindfulness. But precisely what are we doing? What are we doing was every moment of this practice, we are developing the five controlling mental states. Got five controlling mental states. Pincha, Indriya. Pincha is five. Indriya is translated as, as controlling faculties. But these controlling faculties, they are also, in some cases, you have Rupa Indriya. Material controlling faculty. But we are specifically practicing for the mental state. That's why more precise translation would be five controlling mental faculties. But of course, five controlling faculties is understood as such. And what are they, these five? These five are, first of all, it's called Sada, faith and confidence. Second is Vriya, energy, effort. Thirdly is Sati, mindfulness. Fourth is Samadhi concentration. Fifth is wisdom or insight, which is called binya. These are the five. <coughs> and it is still worthy to know this word indriya. The translated as controlling. It also means governing, 
also mean ruling, governing, ruling, controlling. When we say mental states, automatically we know we are referring to Jetasika, mental associates, mental factors. These are the one. Whenever a consciousness arises, a certain mental factors arises together with it. But in here, okay, these five, faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration, and insight, they arises, if we do it properly, they arises together at the moment of noting, at the moment of observation. In other words, the consciousness that is arising at that moment arises together with these five, five mental factors. But they are called Indriya, governing, controlling. Why? Without going too much into detail, we know there are five mental states. Sabda, um, Chanda, let's call it noble desire, Varya, effort, Jigda, okay, consciousness, and Binya. Binya is insightful wisdom. These four. The Buddha said these four are the supreme, supreme mental states among all mental states. What does it mean by it? When these four, one of the four, is exercised, and if that is in play, that is in play. All other mental states follow it. They are the leader of all. In other words, whenever you exercise one of those four, you have developed the very, very powerful supreme commander mental states. And all other mental states fall in line after it. In other words, they are very useful, very powerful mental state to develop. And here is, we call it the first one is Chanda. These four. Chanda. But in our five controlling faculties, if you look at it, we don't see the word Chanda or the desire. But we see the word faith and confidence. Sadda. Sadda is as soon as you have this faith and confidence, okay, you have faith and confidence in something, what happened? Your desire to pursue that object or project or situation arises. So when you say sadda, in other words, you are in a way referring to this noble desire, Chanda. There's a very powerful, strong mental state. That's the way one can look at it. Sada, Because Sada is the cause, Chanda is the effect. So if Chanda is the supreme commander, it cannot arise without this Sada. So when you are developing Sada, in a way, you are developing chanda as well, sattā. So in other words, this sattā of faith is a very powerful mental state you are developing. And if it develops, all others follow. Even the other three, if faith is the leader, effort, consciousness, and insight follow behind it. That is the way it goes. And what is the second 
of the five controlling faculties, Varya, energy, effort. That is also the one of the supreme command, effort. And the third one, third one is mindfulness. Mindfulness is a part of the consciousness, a part of the consciousness. And also the fifth controlling faculty, or the fourth controlling faculty is Samadhi concentration. It's also the part of the consciousness. Okay. As soon as when we say consciousness is the supreme commander, more or less it refers to determination. Because consciousness, Jaita, cannot arise by itself. Whenever it arises, always mental factors or mental states are associated with it. So in here, even though it's not a determination, it's a concentration, it's involved. And the fifth controlling mental faculty is insight or pinya. And one of the four supreme commander is what? Pinya. So these five controlling mental faculties are, they correspond to the four supreme competitor and all mental faculties, the Buddha said. When they arise, everything fall in line behind it. They lead it and they took you to wherever you want to go. If you have these four, you are bound to succeed whatever you are intending to do. Now you know this five mental states. Why are they called controlling? Why are they called governing? Because they govern and they control all other mental states that arises together with them and they lead the way to success. Most of the things in our, our life, in our mental life, you take up them, if one leads, other follows. So we are developing our very powerful mental states. Among all the 52 mental associates, Jistika, these foes are the most powerful. They are the leaders, they are the supreme. They took one to success. And that's what we are developing. But in here, there's one way to understand very, very uniquely. When it comes to Vipassana, when it comes to Vipassana, I just said that when one leads, the other three follows. When it comes to Vipassana, we have a very fine-tuned balancing act. These five, this sada or faith and insight, they has to be balanced. It's not one leading on the other. And also effort and concentration has to be balanced, not one leading the other. They must be in a state of balancing act. Because if sada controls and if insight is far behind, you don't have a balance and you become gullible or you become extremist. You believe in something so blindly, you become extremist. That's what happened. But if intelligence took over and the sata is not strong, faith is not strong, you become very clever, very wicked, 
and you are the master manipulator. Those kind of things can go in either direction, so that's why it must be balanced. But there's one, sati. Sati is a mental state in which it is said it's never in excess. In other words, you do not have enough of this sati mindfulness. Because this strong and powerful mindfulness, in other words, let's call it perfect mindfulness, is the one that balances the other two pairs. Mindfulness is the one that is balancing the other two pairs. That is never in excess. Now you know why these five mental states are called Indriya, governing power or governing faculties or controlling faculties. In the stream of your psyches, these are the most powerful and if you can perfect them, they are status. Anything you pursue is sure to succeed. So those are the ones we are observing and noting and noting. And every noting, every moment, every observation, these five mental states arises together. They are there. If you do it perfectly, precisely, and correctly, they are there. Of course, if the precision fail, one or the other is missing, or all of them are missing, or some are in excess. But our duty is to keep on doing again and again and again and again so that unison and harmony and perfect cooperation of these five come into order. That repeated observation, that repeated exercise of achieving the perfect mindfulness is called bhavana mental culture or mental development. That's what we are doing. Every moment, we are developing these five mental states. Because these five mental states are the one that will take you, take, will take us to the goal or objective, which is eliminating and uprooting all form of physical and mental suffering. Peace. Nibbana. Because that's the objective, the goal. These five can take you there because they are the powerful forces. But you must repeat again and again and again and again patiently. Persistent, consistent. And that's what we are doing when we said we are meditating. We are meditating is we are developing these five mental states. Now we know what they are. The first one is what? Sadda, faith or confidence. Faith and or confidence. And to have that, we already know. We have to understand the process thoroughly. We have to know the benefits. We have to know the pitfalls of practicing or not practicing this meditation. And then the faith or belief arises. Belief. Belief in the practice arises. Only when we believe, then we start doing it. If you don't believe, you won't move a finger. Only when you believe, you do something about it. 
Only when you have a confidence in something, you do something about it. Now you have you done your part. This faith can't. The original Buddhist word is called sadha. So sadha is in here. There are two parts, two meaning under that. One is believing. One is believing, and another one is calm. Clarity and calmness. Believing is one part. Clarity and calmness is another part. So whenever we say sada or faith, that sense of believing in something and clarity and calmness are there. That's what it means by sada. And here we keep on saying faith, 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 faith. One need to understand Buddhist faith is different from the general understanding of the faith. Most of us understand as soon as we say faith, that's a blind faith. You have to believe blindly, without line and reason. Buddhist faith is not so. But of course, if one hasn't started anything, one do not know. The only thing is, you can explore as much as you can based on the information that's accessible to you. Based on that assessment, how you consider it? It's what one pursuing. It sounds pretty sound, pretty good. Then that is the first level of faith. Pursue it. But still there are many things that you do not understand. At that moment, what happened was, at that moment, for those parts that you haven't understood or that you couldn't comprehend, you have to keep an open mind to it. That is similar to blind faith, believing in something you don't know. But in here is, these are not forever that you don't know, that you have to forever believe in it without knowing. As you go along, as you explore along, as you investigate along, then all these things are verifiable. You can get your own proof. So Buddhist faith is called in a way, verifiable faith. Verifiable faith. So that's what sadha means. Two parts. One is believing. Second part is clarity and calmness. These two come. Very simple example. Faith or confidence. A child playing in the park. Suddenly, she or he lost sight of the parents. There's an anxiety and worry coming. Run here, run there, scream, yell, and finally the parents are looking to they found one another or each other. At that moment, the child looked at it because the child has a faith or belief or confidence and they parents. As soon as she saw the parents, suddenly all this anxiety and worry she is suffering from is gone. Instead, there's the clarity and calmness and happiness arises. That's what confidence did. This is a very simple but effective example of understanding that believing and calmness and clarity connection. So I think that much enough for what sadha means. <coughs> and specifically for us as we are practicing this mindfulness and sight meditation, 
which is specific and exclusive for the Buddhism. This is what the Buddhists taught. You can't find this meditation in any other segments in part of the world or religions. Because this is taught by the Buddha. So as a practitioner, inside mindfulness meditation or practitioner, one needs to believe in the Buddha. One needs to believe in the Buddha. Because if you don't believe in the Buddha, whatever he said will be useless, meaningless like anything else. So one needs to believe in the Buddha or you can call it have faith in Buddha or have confidence in Buddha. First of all is, in general, Buddha is, it's not a legend, it's a actual historical figure, that's number one. It exists around the northern part of in India, around 2,600 years ago. That's the first steps. And these are because of the evidence, historical evidence, <coughs> archaeological evidence. And then, more importantly, there are many qualities of Buddha, of course. Among those two qualities, we'll take two critical for the practitioner, for the yogi. One is called Rahata Mega. Okay. What it means is, the Buddha is totally free from mental defilements mental defilements or mental unwholesomeness. In general, lava, dosa, moha, greed, anger and delusion. There is no trace left in him, not even a trace left in his psyche or in his stream of consciousness. At all time, it is free from these mental defilements. In other words, purity is there at all times. One needs to believe in it. That Buddha is at all times, his stream of consciousness is free from mental defilements, Lopa, Dosa and Moha. You really need to believe that because that is what you are practicing for so that your stream of consciousness also become totally uprooted from these mental defilements. That is your goal, that's your objective because only when your mind is free from these mental defilements you will be free from all form of suffering. As you are practicing for it, and if you don't believe Buddha is free from that, this whole campaign or this whole meditation project you are taking upon is useless. That's why one needs to believe have faith that Buddha is totally free from any form of mental defilements. That's number one. That quality is called Arahan or Arahata. Arahata is a person who has uprooted this mental defilement. And we are trying to become Arahat eventually, which means Arahat is a name. The quality is the mind, your mind will be free from these mental defilements. Not a trace, nothing, nothing can attack, nothing can exist. That's one. And second quality, like whenever we are saying, you remember we are saying, Namo Tassavadoato, 
arahato. Arahato is that's what it means. Free from mental defilements. Sama sambuddhasa. Sama is correct. Sama sambuddhasa. Sama sambuddhasa is the Buddha. Okay, everything he knows. Everything he knows. is totally free of teacher is he discovered by himself he discovered by nobody taught him that is number one and also he knows correctly and truthfully everything needs to know everything needs to know what does everything needs to know in terms of Lokiya, Lokiya means our mundane world, our social existence, and at our level, whatever is happening at our level in terms of mental states, correctness and incorrectness, right and wrong, wholesome and unwholesome. These aspects of the mundane Lokiya mental states, he knows. Not only that he knows, he knows everything who is in what kind of mental states. And that's why, as he knows, he can teach exactly what is needed. All that it needs is to push the right button. We are somewhat enlightened in some way, but there, in some cases we are totally blocked. If a teacher come in, knows how to unblock that channel. Voila, it's done. That is the quality of Buddha. And also, he knows everything there is to know about Lokotara. Lokotara is ultra-mundane world, not mundane world. And that is Sama Sambuddhasa. And also, it is also called as Sabinyuta Jnana, Sabinyuta Jnana. In other words, he has the wisdom to cut through with clarity, with precision, the correctness of both the worldly things and beyond the worldly things. Mundane world as well as ultra-mundane world. So he also has that quality. So those two qualities, yogi must believe in it, that the Buddha has it. The Buddha has it, the Buddha has attained it, and the Buddha has turned around and taught the whole world that one needs to believe. That's what it means by sadha for us, believing in Buddha, believing in He's not a god. He's not a supreme being. He's not a supremely powerful being. Nothing as such. He's a human being, but it's a perfect human being in which no unwholesome trace can be seen or will be done. And all that is left is their total wholesomeness and purity. Not only that, he knows the means and ways of how to avoid and how to achieve these states. And he knows means and ways of how to teach these to all others in the most effective and efficient way. That's what Buddha is. Buddha, he who knows. One must believe, one must have faith that Buddha has these qualities. That is what it means by Sada and the Buddha. And secondly, okay, we just more like that as a personal, personalized, a Buddha, a historic character person. Secondly is what he taught. What he taught we call it Dharma, Buddha Dharma. Dharma taught by the Buddha. We must believe in the Dharma too. 
what he has taught. Of course, this will be endless to talk about. So in here, we can approach in a very simple way. Simple way based on our practice. Let's approach it on a practical way to the Dhamma. What are we doing? We are practicing inside meditation using the tool of full foundation of mindfulness. Mindfulness inside meditation. And at all times we are developing the five controlling mental faculties. And if we are doing it to the best of our ability, as correct as possible, as precise as possible, repeatedly, again and again and again, persistently, without giving up, without giving up, if we do that, slowly and slowly, what happens is, in your own practice, you come to understand this is the body and this is the mind. We are always say, we always go around, okay, you, me, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, you're fine. This is he, this is she, this is so and so, this is Mrs. so and so, this is so and so. We always identifying, identifying, identifying. And defining the self, self or me self or you self or them self or they self. This self, identifying mostly when the Christ emphasizes on the body, the form, the look, the height, the color. That is how we identify the self. We heavily use it. We don't even think beyond that. So and so, automatically, we talk, we know how it looks, how it lives, what it is, everything in that spell. But some people go a little beyond that, not only the time, a little bit more curious people. Oh, oh, this is the body, and here is the mind, and we say, oh, this body is the vehicle, here is the consciousness. To that level, it will go. But in general, we don't really try to distinguish or discriminate between the body and the mind. And this is me, this is you, that is how we are always identifying. And the Buddha said, no, what we believe as self, you or me or I, is actually two phenomena. One is a physical phenomenon and one is a mental phenomenon. Those phenomena combine you are identifying as a self. That's what Buddha said. Physical phenomena and mental phenomena. Simply say, this body and this mind, that's what you are calling you. And also, the father expand. This physical phenomena and this mental phenomena are two entirely different phenomena walking together. They are totally separate, working together. In other words, this body and this mind, what we call self, what we think together is not two, totally two. One is the body, physical processes and phenomena. Another is the mind, mental processes and phenomena. They are working together. Ah, okay, sounds good, and in a way. And even that, only a handful of people farther venture and look into that understanding conceptually. Most people don't even bother to look at it. Ah, you, me, that's it. Move along and go along and they bond, they live and they die. But a few people venture into it, this concept of me and you into the two phenomena. Theoretically, oh, okay, sounds good. And some people, father, they become yogis and they practice. You practice this specific mindfulness inside. And you're practicing 
That's what the Buddha said, and you're practicing, and you're practicing. And at one point, okay, suddenly, not intellectually, not thinking, not reflecting, suddenly you felt, suddenly you sense, and suddenly you experience this body is actually a physical phenomenon and this is the mental phenomenon so these two are totally different. In your practice, you experience that. And at that time, even though you experience it, why? You are repeatedly observing, observing, observing as taught, as instructed. Because of that you experience. Even though you experience this discriminative awareness between the mind and the body, at that time, if you overall analyze and look at this situation, your mind is still wandering and your body is still jittering and swaying and moving and changing the positions and still doing it, but still you have experienced that. Because when you are like a hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of observations, there are some moments it come into sync. That little perfect sinking moment, you experience it. But in general, your mind is still wandering and thinking and thinking and planning and your body is still moving around, jittering. But you have already experienced the first. That's what the Buddha said. And I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. That's what the Buddha said. That's interesting. And what it is? Because he has faith. He believes. He has sadha. And what the Buddha is, and what the Buddha taught, and he is practicing. Because that sadha, that faith, push you to do this. Because of that sadha, you come to experience this the discriminative awareness between mind and body. And then you keep doing it. And then suddenly you begin to experience again this body and mind relationship, causal relationship. You're thirsty. You want to drink. Your thirsty is the physical phenomenon. The body has a very dry mouth and throat. And then the mind wants to drink. That body is the cause. Thirstiness is cause. Wanting to drink is the effect. And wanting to drink is the cause. Picking up the bottle is the effect. Or drinking is the effect. As such, you begin to see the relationship between mind and body, body and mind, mind and mind. The two phenomena, how they work together. That is called, you have experienced or you have understand the causal relationship between the mind and the body. Because you are persistently through that faith, repeatedly observing for days and days, weeks and weeks, months and months, you can't even understand. At that time, if you look at it overall, your mind is still wandering, your mind is still thinking, your body is still agitated. Not as much as before, but still moving here, moving there, swaying here, swaying there. Still. But there are certain moments that you sink and at those moments you experience the thing. Ah, okay. This is the what Buddha said that we will discover. Now I have experientially understood. It gives you more motivation. It is inspiring when you do father. When you do father, what happens? You begin to understand 
the anicca, dukkha, and lata. Because everything you're observing, they arise and pass away. And especially at that time, you began to feel a lot of pain and a lot of itch and a lot of headaches and a lot of nausea. And you can't do anything about it. That is what is really happening. And you think your meditation is going down the drain. Before it was a little okay, the first two stages. Now it's become you can't do anything. You become spiraling down. But in fact, what? Not intellectually, not conceptually, but experientially, you are experiencing Nicca, Dukkha, Nata. Impermanent suffering and uncontrollability. So, in here you don't even have to analyze what kind of overall state it is. The overall state is you are totally wrecked and totally in a chaos. That is your overall meditative status. The first, thinking, wondering, moving. Second, thinking, wondering, moving. Third, worse than ever. But, some yogi give up, some yogi, no, I'm going to push. Because Buddha said there is something farther down the line, it's not so bad. And you push, and you push, and you push. And suddenly, what happened was, all these aches and pains and nausea and headaches starting to drift away, and you feel like your body is light. Sometimes you sit down and like you have been pressed down, and suddenly you feel like you're light, like a second of floating. And it seems like you are more fit to do this. You feel like you are more alert, and you feel like your meditation is going quite well. So well, you don't even have to put effort. You can see these objects arising and pass away, arise and pass away, arise and pass away. Those kind of things starting to happen. And when those kind of things starting to happen, what is really happening is you are able to pick up every object that is arising. You see them arise and pass away. Right after that, there's another thing arise and pass away, arise and pass away. You can pick up every object without missing. You see the beginning, you see the end. You see the beginning, you see the end. One after the other, without a break, without a gap without missing any object. That is where you are. Why? Because you don't give up and you keep pushing and you keep pushing and you repeat again and again and again and again. And your practice becomes stronger, practice make perfect, because you now really learn how to observe correctly when to pick up the first object, when to let it go, when to pick up, when to let it go, when to pick up, when to let it go. Your skill in observation become very proficient. That is the reason. And as soon as you can observe in that manner, suddenly there are changes in your body and in your mind. That's why you feel like light, you feel like floating, there's no pressure, okay, everything you do is more like automatic, everything is flowing, everything in your direction, everything seems to be fantastic and great. That's what's happening. That's also Buddha has told us ahead, that's what you will experience. And as soon as you experience that, what happened is the mind, overall thing, the mind, 
There's no wondering, no thinking, no reflecting, just picking up objects one after the other. You are aware of all these pleasant sensations and feelings. The mind has become very calm because you don't have to even put effort. So there's no conflict, no confrontation. Everything is a flow. The mind has become very calm and also very clear. That means you can see everything with clarity, calm and clear. That is a very, very good experience. It's very pleasant. The Buddha said, that experience is better than any pleasure a human can experience in a normal life. Whatever pleasure you have, this pleasure, this pleasantness is superior. And even it says, okay, Dewa too, they have uh, many different levels. The lower level of Dewa's pleasure is inferior to this experience. That's what Buddha said. And you are experiencing it. And when you experience that, what happened? When you experience that, suddenly your faith, your belief, your confidence, your sadha in this Dharma practice just jump many folds. Jump many folds. Because that is what is being said, and now you are experiencing it. Before the beginning of the practice, with your intellectual understanding, you have a faith and confidence. And once you have this experiential insight of the fourth level, your sata just increase many fold. So that shows sata is not a status. Sata is always enough dynamic and progressive mode. That's another quality of sadha. That's why it said belief, clear and calm. And when you truly experience the clarity and calmness, at that moment, your sadha cannot be compared to what you have started. What you have started is pretty good. It gives you a pretty good amount of energy to push you through. But now, this sadha is very, very powerful and strong. So strong, once you have that properly mature, you are quite sure going to push right to the end of the journey. And our teachers usually say, at that stage, you are on the path, in English, you are on the path, because you won't miss the road anymore. Till then, you can sidetrack and you can lose your road map, or you can lose your track and then go in the wrong way. Once you get there, it is said, you are on the path. You won't go wrong because you know you are skillful how to do the job and you have already had experience or achieved a certain result of benefit, clarity and calmness. You are on the path. That is believing in Dharma. Along with the believing in Dharma, it indicates that your sadha is not a static one belief and that's it. No, it is always changing, changing. It has so many rules to progress. So this little Dharma experience trying to relate to the belief of faith and Dharma. One must have confidence and faith and Dharma and the practice that we are doing.
even though we might not have experienced these things, believe in it. Keep an open mind because it will change your life. And thirdly, it is Sangha. Sangha is the monks. The monks are first and foremost. You have to believe. You have to believe that they are practicing. They have renounced everything and practicing for this path. And they are endowed with disciplines. They are following this noble path and also they are practicing this for their personal benefits as well as the benefits of others because they invested their whole life into it. If you believe in the way, you will have a respect and honor for the monks. Of course, you have to look for the right monks or right teacher to teach you. That is the third. Having faith in Buddha, having faith in Dharma, having faith in Sangha. Believe that they are truly working for liberation and also helping others to be liberated. That belief. And as a Buddhist, you need to believe in Karma Vipaka. Karma is the action and Vipaka is the resultant. In short, if you do wholesome thing, you will reap wholesome result, good result, beneficial result. If you do unwholesome thing, you will have unwholesome effect, bad effect, nasty effect. Nobody is inflicting upon you, nobody is judging you. Nobody is presiding on your actions. You are your own witness. You create your own life. Because we are making choices every moment. And every moment based on the choices we made. We made a wholesome actions or unwholesome actions. Actions mean both or triple physical deed, verbal deed, and mental deed. Whichever way they have the effect. And these effects are, it could be immediate, it could be delayed but still in this life, or it could be delayed for many lives after. And also, the life that we are having right now, the one that we face right now, except from the choices we made, are the resultant of the past action we have done. Karma Vipaka. Actions and its resultant. Those are the fives. And these five, we must have sada. And if you have Sada in these five, you will have a lot of effort will arise. Your desire will grow, effort will arise. Because of the faith, your effort arises. And you, because of that exertion of the effort, your mindfulness becomes very strong. And because of the strong mindfulness, concentration is developed. And because of that, a certain amount of keen concentration, your insight into the nature of mind and matter will be experienced. That's how the five are related. Today we go detail on what Sada is. And then the other four will fall the next time. So may all may be able to practice Satipatthana Vipassana meditation precisely and correctly and we will be able to perfect these five controlling mental faculties as soon as possible. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.
สาธุพุทธมนังอุเชมีธรรมดามังอุเชมีสังกัมอุเชมี